very warm welcome to today's session hosted by Gulf Business in association with Harriet Watt University. Firstly, I hope all of you are staying safe during these uncertain times. Now, many of us have started going back to office, back to our workplaces, but unfortunately for some people, they're not gonna be heading back right now. Now the economic crisis that the pandemic has brought on has meant that companies have been forced to shrink their operations. Many people have lost jobs. Others who are in their positions are still insecure about the future. And on the other hand, you have hiring sluggish because companies are scared to take on additional costs. So the outlook for young professionals um, is not great. There, many of them are in a very tough situation. Now, longer term as well, looking beyond the pandemic, we have AI automation and there's talk about how it's going to take away jobs in the market. Um, now, in this kind of a scenario, where is an answer for professionals entering the job place, those who are part of the job uh, workforce, what is the answer they have? Now, one answer lies in upskilling and ensuring that could be one way to ensure that your skill sets remain relevant. To understand more on that is our discussion today, but before we, I introduce my esteemed panel to you, just a quick um, reminder of the format and facilities we have during the session, feel free to post any questions you have. There is a Q&A option there, so you can post your questions to the panelists. Um, those that are relevant to the discussion, we'll take them up during the discussion itself. And for others, we have a dedicated Q&A time at the end. So we will take up the rest of the questions at that point. Again, any other questions you have, you can keep it to the end. Please follow Gulf Business on social media, at Gulf Business on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and at Gulf Business Magazine on Instagram. And with that, we'll start today's session. Let me introduce my panel to you. I have, we have with us Professor Amar Kaka. He is the Provost and Vice Principal of Harriet Watt University, Dubai. We also have Dr. Paul Hopkinson. He's the Associate Head of Edinburgh Business School, Harriet Watt University, Dubai. And we also have with us Sabi Kisaf. He's the Chairman of the Institution of Civil Engineers. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Artie, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I really wanted to start by thanking Gulf Business for organizing this uh, uh, virtual planning discussion. Uh, I, uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, RT, uh, upskilling is a very, very important topic, particularly in times uh, like this. So I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, a very helpful discussion that we could all benefit from. So my name is Ammar Kak. I'm the Provost and Vice Principal of Harriet Watt University in Dubai. I'm actually a civil engineering by civil engineer by training, uh, but my research career is focused on more on the management and economic side of the construction. But I've always been uh, very passionate about uh, widening access to education, uh, and uh, uh, transnational education is uh, is a is a successful way of widening access. So this is why. Uh, you know, having joined Harry Walt University, first of all, in, in at the, our Edinburgh campus, uh, I was very keen to uh, to join our Dubai operation and take a more leadership uh, role in here. Great, thank you. Thanks, uh, Omar. Paul. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Hopkinson, and I'm the associate head, as, as Artie mentioned, of the Edinburgh Business School here in, in Dubai. Edinburgh Business School is the largest of the five schools uh, as part of Harriet Watt. My background is actually in marketing. I, 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 I've, I've been teaching marketing for, for some 20 years now. Um, I also have had a, an interesting background into my, my career, having started originally in electronics and moving into education later in life. So. Um, I'm a living uh, example and uh, advert for the importance of upskilling as you go through life. Um, so thank you very, very much for inviting us along today. Um, it's, it's really a privilege to be involved in this event and, and it's great to be talking about such an important issue as upskilling. And Sabi, please. Thank you very much, Arti. As uh, Arti mentioned, um, I am um, the chairman of the ICE UAE local committee, but my day job is I'm working for Hyperloop Transportation Technology. I'm the head of engineering for the MENA region. My background is uh, civil uh, structural engineering and mainly bridges, hence my background picture. Um, <laughs> I, I work for, uh, I'm working for Hyperloop for the last four, four years, previously with Atkins, was technical director for the Doha Metro. Prior to that, I'm the head of uh, civil infrastructure 
or the Abu Dhabi DOT, uh, Integrated Public uh, Transport Network. Also, I started my career here in, uh, in UAE 2007 on the Kizad project. I was um, uh, lead structural engineer coming from, from London, working for London Underground. Uh, worked on uh, a lot of interesting and exciting projects like Heathrow Terminal 5. I designed the infrastructure for the land side. I also worked on the A13 uh, in, uh, in London and uh, around the globe on the um, heavy uh, civil infrastructure project. Uh, thanks for the core business for giving us the opportunity to speak to you and give us our perspective on the current situation and future of uh, the uh, industry uh, for the young uh, engineers. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks. I mean, we have a lot of experience on this panel, so let's get started. My first question is the very, very basic question. Um, why is upscaling key? I mean, you've all kind of given a perspective with your background itself, like Paul mentioned, but why is it upskill? Why is it key right now, uh, Professor Amar? Can I uh, start off with you, please? Okay. So, uh, upskilling is 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 really key in any times of disruptions, um, and uh, you can see what actually happened during the past industrial revolutions, where upskilling played a significant role in driving these re uh, revolutions and in driving change. So, obviously, we are currently uh, going through an industrial revolution. And uh, change is taking place at a, at a really rapid and, and massive scale. Uh, so there will be a and there is a massive uh, need for upskilling. But I wanted to particularly talk about the COVID situation. And uh, mm. as we all know, uh, you know, COVID, COVID is is having a, a, a an impact on economies globally. So as mm. uh, you alluded to earlier on is, is many people are losing their jobs or at risk of losing their jobs. Uh, but what is, the, what is the impact in the long term of COVID? Uh, and I think there are two conflicting lines of thinking here. Is there's, there's the one group or one line of thinking, which is, uh, you know, COVID is a temporary phenomena. It's a blip and people and population is going to get back to their old way of doing things uh, once COVID is over. The other line of thinking is a more positive one, and it's, uh, it's embracing the change that we have to go, we had to go through during uh, the COVID uh, time, uh, and uh, it's turned this into opportunities. So how can we actually embrace this change, and how can we capitalize on this change and, uh, and uh, exploit it in a way that we can perhaps uh, gain efficiency in our organization or tap into or grow uh, into new markets. So uh, personally, I think it's the latter line of thinking will prevail. The, uh, those who are currently in the formal line of thinking will probably be left behind. Uh, but whatever line of thinking there is, uh, I think everybody is sure that there will be a recovery in the economy post-COVID sooner or later, and we all have to be ready for this recovery. So coming back to the question about uh, upskilling is in any time of change, there's, uh, people will realize that they, they are in need in uh, acquiring different kinds of skills uh, to help them cope with the challenges and opportunities that they and also their organization will be facing over the next year. So it's very, very important in this time. Paul, well, anything that you would like to add? Yeah, I, I would just build on um, Professor Omar's comments there and say that it's really an imperative for not just for employees, um, employers, but economies mm. in general that, that we, we do invest in upskilling and, and reskilling. Um, gone are the days where we could start our careers and, and keep a job for life. Um, we're already in a situation where people are changing their jobs multiple times in their lifetime between 10 and 12 and 14 times, I think the statistics suggest. So, you know, we're already in a, in a, a state of having to change. So reskilling, upskilling is, is part of what we'd expect as we go through uh, life. 
technology, of course, has accelerated that. And as, as Mars says, you know, the fourth industrial revolution has, has, has mm-hmm. increased uh, the pace of change quite rapidly. And, it, and it's meant that digital disruption, uh, digital transformation has become, uh, you know, a, a buzzword in most sectors. And what the pandemic has done really is to accelerate a lot of that change. So it's actually brought a lot of this to the fore. And, and, and now we've got to uh, think about it. Um, and whereas in the past, it was an option. You know, digital disruption, nice. digital transformation was very much an option. Today, it, it is an imperative. We have to do it. Um, and we've, we're forced to think of new ways to connect with our customers. We're forced to think of new ways of employ, uh, connecting with our employees and our colleagues. So, um, and then just to get to, to echo also what uh, Amar is saying there about the future. I, I think what, what the pandemic does um, also is it gives us an opportunity to not go back to the old normal um, and to see what actually we can do without and the mm. things that we can embrace the changes that we can embrace positive changes that we can embrace and um i, I know we're going to be talking about the education sector specifically a little bit later but you know the, the, our sector has been on a, a disruptive trans, um, trajectory for some years and and during the the financial crisis in the in 2008 people are talking about returning to the new normal um, but you know what, 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 what we've got an opportunity now to really embrace change and, and find new ways of uh, connecting with our audiences. I think that word "new normal" constantly keeps changing. Right? <laughs> it's like yeah. that, which is the new normal? Before you realize there is another new normal that's come up almost. Um, there's a really good, there's a really good uh, um, ad actually that's been floating around in the UK at the moment, which says, "Let's not go back to normal." which I think is a good way of looking at it. <laughs> True, exactly. Um, so if I can bring you in from an industry perspective, why do you think upskilling is key right now? Um, I mean, all employer want to have a flexible, uh, agile, and uh, uh, workforce that can make the employer competitive in, in the market. And also client asking for people with multiple skills and in the construction industry, in order to, to bid for a job, sometimes mm-hmm. you have to qualify technically before you go on the financial side. And if you don't have qualified people who can uh, tackle any issues related to their business, it's, uh, it's very difficult for an employer to be competitive within the, the market. It's also from the professional point of view, it's the uh, learning, it doesn't stop when we finish university. The right. university is give us the foundation where we start. Basically, this is the foundation and up to you as individual and the employer to build on it. And mm. things change and therefore uh, you have to be up to date and being up to date, you have to uh, you know, get new skills, go on new training courses, go as an, another uh, qualification. And from the professional, as I said, I'm representing the institution of civil engineers, one of the oldest uh, institution in the world. 2018, we celebrate 200 years. And basically one requirement from the old professional institution, you have to keep developing yourself and you have to have CPD, continued professional development. And the continuum of professional development is gained via develop, developing yourself. And if you don't have record of your continuum professional development, you will not be able to compete in the job market as individual, as a company. And this is not for the IC only, but also uh, for all the professional institutions from the UK and around the globe. The value of continue developing yourself for you as an individual and for your mm. employer to make you more competitive within the uh, market. Great, thanks. Uh, one question, Paul, if I can come to you for this one, is that building on this, we've kind of understood the basic requirement of upskill, uh, upskilling, but in the current situation, like we mentioned earlier, there are people who are losing jobs. There are people who are scared that they're gonna lose their jobs. So one question everybody has is, Will this ensure, will upskilling myself ensure employability? Um, is that is there an answer? Is there a yes answer to that? So I, th- I think obviously the current situation is incredibly uncertain for a lot of people, and I, th- I think we can't lose sight of the fact that that that, that uncertainty is, is is very difficult and unsettling. Um, 
So one of the ways in which you cope with uncertainty is to invest um, and to diversify your risk, if you like. Um, and, and one of the ways to do that is diversify your skills base. So this is really about uh, making an investment in building resilience. It's a big, making an investment in building your future employability. Um, yeah. Because uh, as we know, and as Miles made the point as well, you know, this we don't know how long this current situation is going to last, but we do know that a lot will change post-pandemic. Um, we, we may not go back to the old normal. Um, so building kind of that resilience, investing in yourself is, is really what, um, what, what people um, need to give consideration to. I think it's important to recognize as well that if, if, you, if you look at some of the reports that people like the World Economic Forum have been putting out you know that there are lots of there is a lot of clear messages about the future and about how uh, automation is going to be taking increasing proportions of people's jobs there's also messages about how uh, AI and machines in general are going to be taking increasing proportions of people's job uh, tasks but balance with that there's a huge number of opportunities and there was an interesting report actually quite recently done by the uh, WEF where they were talking about 6.1 million new roles or new job opportunities coming out of uh, uh, about the uh, seven clusters of, uh, of, um, of skills so they were talking about data analytics they were talking about sure. uh, so marketing and sales as being and people management and culture so there were a whole range of areas where they were saying look there's some new opportunities here so you know we can look at it from the negative side we can look at it as saying well okay this is going to uh, automation is going to reduce job opportunities but on the other hand it's also creating lots of new roles and and reskilling and upskilling uh, is what we need to do to to take advantage of those um, but if you look at upskilling itself what are the things that you mentioned about how you know new jobs are being created so is should it all be focused on tech or sh you know how do students decide how do professionals decide on which course to yeah. to take when they when they're looking at it it becomes a very difficult decision uh, you know when you're looking at that amar yeah. any what would be your suggestion okay so i think uh, most importantly first is uh, you understand why you want uh, well, what you want to get out of the upskilling, uh, and uh, what is it? What what's the purpose for you personally? And uh, uh, I wanted to take you through three or four scenarios uh, that will help in your decision making going forward. And uh, obviously, there are master's programs and solutions to those uh, scenarios. So the first scenario is that. Uh, you know, you are happy with your job, uh, you want to, to, to continue with your profession, uh, but you want to be more effective, more relevant, and more specialized. So, okay. uh, an example of that, for example, you have a, a civil engineering degree, uh, but you wanted to uh, enroll in a master's in uh, geotechnics or structural engineering, uh, and therefore you're advancing uh, your skill through specializing. Uh, the other scenario is uh, uh, you are uh, in aspiring or you're about to take a, a more leadership position in your organization uh, and uh, you want to acquire the skills that will enable you to step up and, and, uh, and take uh, uh, these uh, roles leadership and role. leadership roles. Uh, so I'm sure everybody probably realized that I'm talking about the likes of an MBA or or, uh, or a project management masters, and, and I'm sure Paul could uh, talk uh, far more about this. Uh, the third scenario is, is actually is when you want to change your career. Uh, oh. so you are uh, either not excited anymore about what you're doing, or maybe the demand for the service you are providing is in decline. Oh. Uh, and in those situations, you would uh, look for a, what we call a conversion master's uh, degree and i have actually a real example here in dubai in, in our campus we we during the past uh, recession in 2009 the economic uh, the credit crunch we did actually experience a surge in enrollment onto our masters in facilities management so as you know construction was booming just before the recession and there were lots of 
beautiful buildings being built in Dubai and UAE and infrastructure. Uh, but as construction slowed down, uh, there were more demand actually for people who would look after these buildings and infrastructure and maintain them. And hence the facility. And I think my fourth category uh, is, uh, is, is really upskilling by, you know, and, and looking at, at enhancing the soft skills, which uh, I think uh, Paul has uh, alluded to as well. Is, uh, and uh, I think it's important in this circumstance, and this could apply to all the other previous four, uh, th three categories. But in this situation, you, you really need to understand what soft skills you are strong in and, uh, and what are your gaps. And uh, you really need to look okay. for a, a, a program that, or a course that could help you to uh, enhance those uh, skills. So I really wanted, uh, in terms of uh, getting feedback from uh, from the audience here, uh, I really wanted to uh, to to check, you know, where do they feel they belong into these four categories, and hopefully we'll we'll, we'll get to see the feedback uh, towards the end of the uh, of of the session and maybe discuss it. Um, yeah, so we have the poll coming up. We have a poll. So if all of you can just vote, um, and then, yeah, we'll come back to the results, as Amma mentioned. Sorry, I interrupted Amma, yeah. No, no, that, that's yeah. fine. Uh, but it's, uh, but the only thing I wanted to add is actually is, is once, once you've chosen the type of program mm -hmm. you want to enroll in, the next mm -hmm. thing is, you know, you, you want to look at uh, what university you want uh, to, sure. to, to enroll in. And uh, there, there's obviously uh, a lot of, uh, information in the public domain, uh, you know, ranking of the universities and, and so on. But I really wanted to encourage everyone to look beyond that as well and, uh, and uh, try and talk to the faculty, try to talk to the admission uh, team and, and, and see how suitable uh, the university you're enroll enrolling to. I'll give you again another example is, uh, for example, is, is, uh, is you know, uh, which university can offer you uh, more exposure, more global experience, more global exposure, uh, more uh, global networks after you graduate. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in times like, like this, uh, you know, we are faced with the challenges that, uh, you know, in order to address those challenges, you need a global approach, you need a global effort. Uh, so that's actually particularly something we value quite a lot at Harriet Walt. It's, it's one of the, our distinctive and unique offering, uh, which, uh, which I think is very, very important. Okay. Uh, we have one question I have, uh, which I think is quite relevant. It's come from Shisha. And she says, upskilling in the face of job search necessarily means acquiring knowledge through courses, mostly online under the circumstances. Such knowledge, which is theoretical and not applied yet in a professional setup, is still valuable to employers or would they still ask for a practical application of the skill acquired? That's her question. So right now, her question is, I think, yeah, more because of the current situation since courses are online. Um, is practical application essential? I think we, uh, maybe Paul will come in after me, but, it's better, but I think I, I, all I would say is at the postgraduate level, at the, at the master's level, is we, you know, universities have... Uh, delivered master's education online for quite some time now. So there's a lot of experience in, in delivering uh, master's programs uh, at online. And uh, I, I, think, uh, I think in terms of uh, uh, you know, practicality and, and uh, uh, there, there's a lot that you can do still online, but obviously I think we're, this is an area we'll talk about uh, later on in terms of uh, you know, future landscape and how education will, will change in the future. Well, anything you would like to add? Yeah, um, just to just pick up on Amar's point there. Within our business school, we've had an MBA program, which has been uh, has been pioneering really in distance learning. We've we've had it for some 25 years uh, as a distance learning option, and we've got 30,000 students worldwide. So it's quite a big um, a, a big program. Uh, it's um, in terms of practicality, it's quite an interesting one because I, I think one of the things that sets Harriet Watt 
apart from quite a number of its competitors. It has a big focus on, on practical application. It goes back really to the history of our institution. Um, we're, we're coming up to our bicentennial year. Next year we'll be 200 years old. Um, and for those of you that don't know, we started out as a, a night school um, supplying skilled technicians to the clock making industry. So 200 years later, we're addressing a different res uh, industrial revolution. But, <laughs> you know, what does go to the cent center of what we do is, is providing that practical application. And we very much um, pride ourselves on bringing that to our, to our courses. Sabi, from an, from an industry perspective, her question was, do, do you think that doing a course is adequate or do employers demand practical application? Um, I just uh, pick up from uh, Ammar's uh, point on two things. One, the need and how we're going to choose the course. And two, the accredited course and accredited university. Again, I'm putting mm. my uh, civil engineering uh, hat, uh, institutional mm. civil engineer hat. Uh, Harriet Watt, I'm, uh, I'm very proud of my connection with Harriet Watt, my son was one of the first alumni of Harriet Watt. He started 2007, finished his uh, bachelor 2010 and went to Edinburgh to finish MA. And uh, the other thing about Harriet Watt is it's an, an institution created by two brains, business and engineering. And that's why most of the uh, courses offered by uh, Harriet Watt are practical courses for the industry. Um, Harriet Watt is accredited and most of its courses by most of the professional institution. And that's give whoever going to take these courses the ability and make it easy for him to become professional engineers. Professional engineers is becoming a must and specifically for the region, for the GCC. Most of countries now asking for chartered engineer. And in order to be chartered engineer, you have to have accredited uh, uh, course and I think Harriet Watt is one of the accredited courses and accredited university. Going to the first point of need, do your homework. Don't do a course just for the sake of doing a course. Is this something you want to do? Is this something you want? And also speak to your employer because sometimes employer, if they have a gap and like the current situation, they want to keep their people. And sometimes they pay for the training courses. Talk to your manager, talk to your employer. What is the gap within the company you're working for? And maybe you take a gap, you go, go and do the course which is required by the employer. And therefore, homework is very, very important. Homework, so I think uh, like any in educational institution, homework always <laughs> comes into play. Um, but continuing on from the question that she posed, Amar, have you seen a surge in young professionals joining new courses during the pandemic? Have you seen that happening right now? Uh, okay, so, so our next uh, enrollment is on uh, September. So it's, um, it's kind of uh, a, you know, early days to to make a final judgment on that. But it's, uh, uh, if you compare the applications we've received so far uh, mm. in comparison with the same time last year, we have seen mm. actually an application. But I'm actually, I am expecting a growth in enrollment uh, because uh, this is exactly what happened uh, during the last recession. Uh, okay. and, uh, uh, we did see a growth, uh, particularly at the postgraduate level. And that's because, you know, uh, students re appreciate that if they, for example, they lost their job or, you know, they were waiting for the next uh, best opportunity for themselves. So it's, it's, uh, it's actually, it's the best time to get ready. And it's the best time to invest uh, in yourselves and in your education. Uh, and uh, students appreciate that. Uh, so I am expecting growth. Um, from an industry, I'll come back to you, Sabi, a point that you just mentioned earlier. So from employer's perspective, will, how do they benefit from upskilling their own employees? Is that better for them? Is that more beneficial for them, for employers to do that? Absolutely. Uh, from the employer point of view, you want an agile and flexible workforce. And this not just benefit you as employer, but also benefit the client you're working for. And therefore, 
it's always for uh, employer to upskill their people on uh, new skills. The, the industry is always developing and there's always a need for something new. And if we remember the days, I don't know how many people on this call remember the CAD and the tracers and people working in CAD uh, offices. How many people working? And everyone said when the CAD software came, these people are going to lose their jobs. We, we need more CAD operator nowadays than before. And the employer, seriously, the employer who did not train and prepare themselves for the revolution of the CAD, they were left behind. And they have to always do a catch up. And therefore, the Hello, benefit employer. is... But do they understand this? Do many employers in the region understand this? That this is an investment which is good for their profit. You know, right now, a lot of companies tend to look at it from a very short term perspective where they say, oh my God, I, I, you know, is it really worth my investment? So are they understanding this? Okay, I give you two perspectives. One from the UK side and one from here. We know we are in construction industry and the cheapest price we're going to win. And therefore, sometimes, employer don't allocate training budget for their people but they still see it as a must and sometimes as i said client ask for and part of the bid budget for training the 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 employer see benefit for it and i mentioned it early on you know when the technical qualification in order to bid and win a job first you have to pass the hurdle of you technical, how you technically qualified and your technical qualification is based on the CDs you submit. If you don't pass this, your submission, even if you are the cheapest price, you're not going to win. And therefore it's in your benefit to train your people to make sure that they have the skills required to do the job you're bidding for. And therefore, and sometimes employers don't know what job they're going to bid for. And if they don't have the right people for the job. And the other thing is, when you submit CVs for your people, they have to be yours. And if right. there is a job, we require, let's say, bridge engineer, mm. five bridge engineers, and you don't have any bridge engineer, you can't bid for the job. And therefore, you have to have these skills and you have to ma maintain them and retain them. Otherwise, you won't be able to be competitive within the, the market. Um, there are a couple of questions related to this and uh, Amar and Paul, if you can just take these on. So the one question says, in the UAE, are there many employers who are helping and investing to upskill employees? And also, have you seen a demand from employers investing in their staff? I mean, they're kind of similar um, since the pandemic began specifically. I think if I can, I can come in uh, um, here is uh, we've, we've had experience with uh, working with uh, uh, with organizations so it's a business to business relationship and uh, establishing partnership uh, and uh, and either for uh, you know that organization to sponsor students onto our uh, master's programs and, and and so on but also we've uh, we've had uh, opportunities where we would uh, develop best book uh, short courses okay. organization like that. so we've we've had we've had uh, successful relations at both uh, at both uh, ends and uh, so we have actually in the UAE, we have witnessed that there is the will uh, of organization to support their employees. I think they see the value of, uh, of upskilling their uh, uh, employees, either for uh, retention, staff retention, but also for, for moving forward and, and helping with uh, uh, themselves becoming more competitive, as uh, Sabih mentioned before. Well, something you want to add? Uh, yeah, I, I would just also say, yes, say as well that we've also um, entered a number of MOUs with um, government organisations, employers to, uh, to provide upskilling and, and uh, reskilling of staff. Um, and we, we do see the same organisations come back to us year after year with students as well. So okay. you can see that there's an investment they're making in, in, in trying to uh, upskill. Their, their and so they understand the results, I suppose. If they're coming back to you, they do yeah. witness results. Um, yeah. Moving beyond a little bit beyond the virus now, and Paul, you mentioned about this earlier, you know, disruption in the industry and not talking about a normal anymore, but we, we do have the technology automation side of it. And 
yes, there are new skills that are going to be created, but how can education bridge this gap that's there, you know, where you see people are going to be losing jobs, there are going to be new jobs that are going to be created. So how, what role will education create in, you know, bridging that gap? I guess the glib response would be to say that, that our job as educators is to, to fill the gap. Um, and we need to be agile and responsive to, to seeing where those gaps lie. Um, but a slightly more uh, nuanced response, I guess, is if you, if you look at something like AI, um, mm. it, there's, there's kind of two different views. One is a very pessimistic one, and one is a slightly more op optimistic one about its impact. But one is to say, okay, everybody's going to lose their jobs. You know, uh, So you also see uh, remote uh, automated teaching assistants uh, as well, so not just uh, in... in um, businesses where there's a lot of uh, opportunities for uh, automating manual tasks, but also in, in more knowledge related tasks is where you're starting to see uh, replacement through machines. So uh, that's one pessimistic view, if you like. The other one is, well, actually, there's an opportunity for us to work in tandem or in unison with, with machines and, and try to see opportunities for simplifying some of the day to day tasks and, and freeing ourselves up for some of the more of the knowledge related work. Um, so, you, I mean, you see this reflected in quite a number of the, uh, again, going back to the World Economic Forum and their job skills and, and future of work reports. They're all talking in there about uh, the importance of things like critical analytical thinking and about the importance of um, uh, creativity, for example, all the soft skills. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess, so the more nuanced response is where our role comes in is right. helping to develop some of those softer skills and building um, the more of the knowledge related skills that, mm. that students, uh, graduates will need for their future work uh, career to build re resilience, if you like. Um, and then another view as well is our role is there to help them harness technology and use technology. My, my background is marketing. I, I was a practicing mm. marketer before I taught marketing. Um, I'm constantly having to upskill and reskill because technology is changing everything. Yes. And we were having a conversation actually just before um, we went live um, for this session about something called programmatic advertising. And programmatic advertising means basically that you, instead of employing media buyers and planners to place adverts, you rely on a machine to do it for you. Um, so what is the role then of the media planner and buyer? Well, they become a strategist. So they have to upskill, nice. they have to, to rethink their role. And, you know, we've seen this in, in the past with CNC machines in, in, in production, uh, you know, suddenly you, uh, machinists jobs went away, but then they became machinists, uh, programmers, CNC programmers. So right. it's how do we help people to make those shifts to these mm -hmm. slightly more knowledge related roles? And we can, we can embrace technology, we can look at technology as a means of simplifying and automating mundane tasks and giving us more mm -hmm. time uh, to do other things. Um, and we're seeing this also in our in our business, and Omar will bear this out. You know, we're talking now about delivering more of our lecture content online. Now, some people will say, oh, that's a really bad thing because, you know, we haven't got the face-to-face -face contact. But it doesn't mean that. It means that we can use our, the, the contact time that we do have in more effective ways, you know, and we, yeah. can, we can build relationships with students in the time that we do have. And we can do more interactive things. I think it's just a shift in the way of thinking and working in a sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, in terms of what are the requirements, Sabi, if I can come to you in the future, what are the main talent requirements that we see? I think we have a poll as well um, on what are employers looking for in the region, if we can just have that come up. But in the meantime, Sabi, if you can, what are the talent requirements that you see in this region right now? Um, the Whenever I already mentioned of, uh, you know, the, the CAD and how uh, this changed the industry. We have another example is the uh, software which does the cal structure calculation. And everyone said, we, we're not going to need structural engineer. We don't have enough structural engineers. Also detailer, the same thing. What the, the, the world is changing. And mm. one best example is the, the new technologies the flying taxis, drones, and the best example is the Hyperloop. Hyperloop is, again, I put in my uh, hat of a Hyperloop uh, employee. It, it's going you to have lots of hats, Sabi. <laughs> <laughs> That's the upskilling, reskilling that we're I talking about. <laughs> without the upskilling, I would not be where I am now because I kept developing myself. 
for you know from one country to another for one job to another but it's it's very important and the hyperloop is going to change the way we travel the way we live and there are a lot of new skills required for the industry like the industry is looking at green energy we need more of green energy people sustainability levitation uh, mechanical electrical uh, vacuum uh, all these systems all these skills are not existing 3d printing we need, 3d printing is not just a hyperloop but it's going to be most of the industry small jobs small part of a job is going to be 3d printed high strength concrete uh, green concrete uh, uh, composite material the composite material we when we talk about composite material everyone think of aerospace naval and so on so no the composite material is coming to the construction industry and we have a lot of examples of a bridges carbon fiber we i've been using carbon fiber for strengthening of a bridges cast iron bridges and it's been used for how many years from the 80s at construction material pre-stressing strands use as a carbon fiber and therefore these industries need new, new skills and the people have to look at the niche where they are and how they can do something which is will benefit their employer and themselves right i think um, the yeah. If I can come to Aman, and I think this is one of the questions that's come up here is any short term course is uh, that Harriet what is coming up with to help with the skill upliftment and do you see the men, the points that Sabi mentioned Amar that's that drive the way you're looking at introducing new courses. Absolutely. I, I think as it happens, uh, we were discussing uh, our strategies for uh, for executive education just before we, we joined this uh, webinar, uh, we do feel that uh, uh, the, there's, there's actually, it's quite critical going forward is that we, we offer uh, this, av this availability to the, uh, you know, to the professionals uh, in, the, in, in, in here in the UAE. Uh, you know, some uh, uh, practitioners or professionals will probably not be able to uh, dedicate an entire a uh, year or two to enroll on in a master's program, but then they do need uh, specific skills that they really want to get out of, uh, and we can uh, we can uh, provide that in a shorter uh, time uh, span than than we would in a normal. So we, this is an area which we are uh, very very keen to tap into uh, yeah. going, forward. and we'll, we'll we'll we're looking at this from two perspectives. One is what we call the bespoke perspective, and these are. Okay that we would open up uh, to the market uh, but also we uh, sorry the, these are options that we would uh, uh, open up to individual organization we partner with but then there's the speculative uh, option where we open it to a wider uh, market and people can actually enroll okay and any longer term any big new courses that you're looking at Paul, maybe something in tech since we've been discussing so much about the tech side of things yeah, it's going to be surprising when I say that now, isn't it? <laughs> um, no, I, I, th I think, you know, every university, we, we can't really stand still. And, and in recent years, we've, we've brought in new programs in things like design management. We've brought in um, uh, AI courses. We've brought in data science courses. We've got some other new ones on the horizon. One in particular is digital leadership, um, okay. which is really about helping people and providing them with the skills to lead digital transformation initiatives in business. So and um, we niche, go isn't it? That's it's, it is. It's, but it's really interesting. It's a com something completely different. I don't think I've heard of, you know, digital leadership. That's interesting. So the the idea with that program particularly is to try and combine the technical skills with the managerial input because one of the things that people get very preoccupied with with digital transformation is about the technology. The technology right. becomes the kind of the, the main focus um, but technology is an enabler mm -hmm. and really you've also got to look at the culture and you've got to look at trying to drive forward through leadership um, right. changes within organizations so it's about cultural change it's about leadership it's about the soft skills that you need as well as the technology so what we've done with the program is to combine specialist knowledge of 
things like robotic process automation, AI, business analytics or data analytics, as well as some of the softer management skills with that program. So it's quite a unique program. Actually, if we can have the poll results come up, because you mentioned softer skills. So let's, uh, if we can have the results come up and maybe see what uh, people think employers are looking for, which we just looked at. Um, yeah. So it looks like 50% said judgment and decision making. Um, creativity was the next one and complex problem solving. And five years from now, it, it, it seems quite mixed, but we have creativity, judgment and decision making complex problem solving and people management. That seems to be the consensus though. Um, is this what you were expecting? <laughs> it, it's very much in line with what the WF, uh, EF has been saying for the last couple of years with their, um, with their surveys of, of skill sets. So the one that came out um, strongest actually in, in the last report was about um, analytical thinking. Um, um, and obviously things like creativity, complex problem solving were up there quite ranked high, quite highly as well. Um, but what I was hoping to demonstrate with this is that skills, um, whether they're specialist skills or whether they're uh, softer skills, they're never static. You know, right. they're, they're things that change all the time. And actually, if, if you look over the last three reports by the WEF, the rankings have changed year on year. Um, and what that demonstrates is that we need to constantly upgrade and, and improve our skills. Um, you know, we can never stand still. So I, I think that kind of demonstrates what we were trying to drive out here, which is that things don't stand still. And there is going to be a degree of uncertainty about the future as well. And that's probably reflected in why people are, are sl slightly mixed in their response about the future. Mm. Um, I think we're almost out of time and we, we have a little bit of time slotted for the questions. I, I see that there are three questions waiting, but before we get to them, um, just looking at the future, what is it that, what are the main trends that we can expect to see? If I can get from all of you your inputs on that from an education perspective, I know right now it's very difficult to look into any kind of a, uh, you know, looking ball into the future because the future is so uncertain, new normals. Uh, but what are the major trends you think are going to reshape the industry? Amar, if I can start with you. Yeah, okay. so, so I just wanted, before I answer that, I just wanted to add, uh, to what Paul mentioned about the new programs is we are actually bringing in uh, our uh, uh, mathematics provision, uh, applied maths yep. for the first time ever to the Dubai campus. We are very, uh, you know, globally known for our programs in, in mathematics and, and uh, obviously it's very, very important in, in uh, uh, in current situations where you look at risks, you, you look at data analytics, and we're looking at uh, insurance, actuarial science. So uh, right. I would just to, to bring uh, the audience attention to, to that. But in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, you know, the future landscape of education, uh, I do believe that uh, you know, how university will deliver education will change. Uh, uh, I think there will be more on, uh, reliance on online delivery. Uh, this is kind of uh, already started to, to take place uh, even before COVID. So really COVID has accelerated the progress on, on, uh, uh, on this. But, uh, but I want to stress also that, uh, that physical campuses will remain to be relevant. Uh, it's just that uh, the way we will use these spaces will differ as Paul alluded to is, uh, is uh, I expect that lectures will, more lectures will be delivered online, but it's actually will use uh, the spaces to have more interactions to develop student soft skills, uh, problem solving, uh, networking, uh, and, uh, and, and all of that uh, areas. Uh, other, you know, uh, developments I would foresee in education is, is there will be more growth in, on, uh, in lifelong learning. Uh, you know, as uh, Sabih mentioned, is, is actually as you progress through your careers, you'll, you know, you'll need to uh, update and have, you know, your knowledge to become more relevant uh, as time goes, goes on. Uh, also, I would expect students to probably to have more focus and value for money in, in the future in the education provided. Uh, I think they'll, they'll be uh, more emphasis on global, what can universities uh, offer in global exposure, uh, employability. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we want to see a direct link between a return on their investment uh, and 
in flexibility. People would want uh, more and more flexibility in terms of the pace of uh, uh, you know, studies, uh, even location and, and, and so on. And uh, uh, that's, these are very, very important uh, areas, uh, I, I feel, particularly in, in, uh, in universities like us, where we have multi campuses and different geographical yeah. locations. Uh, and and uh, also uh, augmented by online learning. Um, Paul? Yeah, so I, I would um, endorse everything that, that Amar has, has mentioned there in, in terms of the future. I, I think, as we said at the beginning, uh, the, the education industry internationally has been on a, on a, a path to disruption for some time and uh, obviously more blended and online is is going to um, become the norm. I think the other thing to, to mention as well, well is, you know, it gives us an opportunity to find better ways of connecting with our students because many of our students are digital natives. They are living in an omni-channel world. So they're used to uh, interacting with, with brands in not just, you know, one channel, but all channels, simultaneously in some instances. So, um, and we have to, we have to move in, with with that you know we have to recognize that that's that's the way that our students want to interact so it's giving students opportunities to interact with us in more accessible ways more flexible ways uh, and also give, you know providing opportunities for them to for us to bring education to them um, I, I think those are the, some of the things and the other thing I would say is I think the the institutions that win out through this are not going to be the ones that just look to price and cost they're not going to be the ones that say, okay, it's an easy, quick win. Let's push everything online. Let's go high, large scale online. Um, we'll reduce all our interaction to zero. It's mm -hmm. going to be the ones that look at ways in which we can use our time more effectively and add value in different ways. And as Amar says, it's about, you know, institutions that can build global connections with their students across different campuses and, and, it, and staff as well, um, experts from different locations. It's about how do we build industry into our uh, campuses and into our interactions? How do we bring more industry, industry interaction and contact? Um, so those are the things I think that matter really. It's about how do we add value, not how do we yeah. cut cost? <laughs> so those are the things, yeah. I think the value seems to be the main word right here, which I've, I've noticed from what both of you have said. And Sabi, anything from an industry perspective, is value again going to be the main driver? Yeah, I mean, I education is a must for any nation and therefore a, an educated nation is advancing more than other any other nations but from the the point of how we doing uh, education at the moment and how we're going to do it in the future i mean like online training I, i've been doing it for ages and it's most right. of the big companies been doing it but not at the same scale as now and mm. the current situation pushed us to accelerate and to do it. And as uh, uh, Dr. Ammar said, it's basically the campuses become relevant and will stay relevant. And the reason for that is not just face-to-face. -face. You have, there are certain skills, there are certain things like laboratory testing, touching, doing things have to stay within the campus. You cannot do it on, on the web. But also the soft skills, because we know being inside the campus develop the soft skills of the future uh, technical people and uh, the leadership. And just on the web, you cannot develop this communication, interaction with other people. And therefore, the, the, the current situation pushed us to accelerate and benefit from the stuff. We don't need to be in all the courses in, in the class. No need yeah. for it. We, we don't get, as we speak now, and also we can benefit from people who may be not able to travel and they can deliver interesting and important lecture from where they are. And therefore sure. the current situation is accelerated what we've been doing on a slower scale. But I think the future is, yeah, it's going to be a combination of what we're doing and uh, what is going to be done from uh, webinars and uh, uh, internet uh, and uh, uh, online courses. Okay. Um, I think we'll go to some of the questions and before we go into the first one, maybe we can get the results of, uh, let's see what people had to say. What is it that they are looking for? We've got an idea of what the education trends for the future are. If we can bring up the poll results and see what, what, are, still look, what are they looking at when they are deciding course of study. 
So interestingly, I mean, it's kind of mixed. It says wanting to continue with the same profession, but specialize further seems to be the main one. Wanting to advance into a leadership role is quite high up. Wanting to change profession altogether. Uh, that's the last one, but wanting to acquire and enhance soft skills. So that seems to be a big priority as well. Interesting. Amar, did, is this what you had in mind? <laughs> I actually expected uh, that, uh, uh, interestingly, is uh, the third one, which came out as only 7%. Uh, yeah. uh, I do feel that, uh, uh, you know, people uh, think this is a, probably a, quite a big, big uh, jump to make and uh, you know, a lot of challenges in that. But I, 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 I have actually seen uh, that taking place and there are people who have actually changed their uh, profession That's and very... Idea successfully and, and we're very very happy afterwards oh, interesting uh, let's from a, from the questions that have come in from an engineering perspective someone who's graduated in automotive how easy is it to transition into other engineering fields like civil aero etc what type of courses are there to assist in this is one of the questions that's come in um, maybe sabi is it yeah. from an engineering perspective I mean, yeah, for the civil engineering one, everyone uh, think of uh, civil engineering, think concrete and steel. No, it's not. There are so many things within civil engineering. And I think the most relevant to uh, the question is like MEP. It's, it's, you need uh, little changes to become MEP uh, engineer. And there are courses which basically uh, give you this opportunity and some of the stuff you already done is going to be uh, applicable to what you're going to do as a MEP engineer. That's very true, actually. We've, we've had many, many cases where, uh, you know, we had students uh, uh, with degrees in mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, joining uh, our construction project management masters uh, because okay. they have actually even though they, they were they graduated with mechanical engineering they happened to be working in the construction sector and now they wanted to take a, a more leadership role uh, in managing uh, project so very very true uh, again another question from an engineering perspective if someone studied engineering a long time ago using CAD software like SolidWorks would they have to do a whole new degree to catch up or does Harriet what offer refresher courses Amar Paul so we've we've had uh, we have we do we do pro provide training for our existing students as well in in CAD uh, and uh, and so on and uh, sometimes uh, uh, you know sometimes uh, there's a lot of uh, demand for this uh, and we extend that to uh, to uh, you know people outside uh, the 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 enrolled programs uh, but I, as I said earlier uh, we do feel that. Uh, uh, you know, this is a, a market we, we need to tap into uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, offer speculative programs. And that's an, an area which is actually quite interesting. Uh, if there's en enough demand for it, we will offer it. But do you think also is there, like when you're looking at courses done a long time ago, is it better to do a refresher course or will students benefit from doing something which is completely new or completely different? How does it work? I think both uh, both are very very important. Uh, I think uh, I, I, I even uh, for in, if you take the example about CAD, you really need to uh, to to be to stay relevant, and you really need to live to to have the exposure and training to the latest uh, versions and and uh, and software, uh, and uh, so th they're both relevant, really. Okay. Uh, allow me to add something. Uh, yes, yes, please. I mean, yeah, on the CAD, is, uh, you already have the basis for computerized design. And the, it's basically CAD is 2D, and you have the third dimension become 3D. And nowadays, it's BIM. And the BIM is going to, this is one of the skills I would highly recommend to all uh, civil engineers, because uh, again, as I said, the, the client requirements, BIM has become uh, mandatory within the GCC, and therefore, employer, contractor, consultant have to have on their books people qualified and BIM users. And I think CAD, AutoCAD is very, very close to BIM. If you want to continue in this field, I think it's a it, training course on BIM, it's, it's very relevant. Okay. 
Um, the next question is from Shisha again. As a re recent graduate from Germany in MBA, I'm aiming to get into sustainable solutions in transport and urban planning or urban mobility in UAE. What can be suggested on specific skills is the question. Is there, are there any specific skills, Sabi? Maybe? It's, uh, I mean, as I said, the, the uh, sustainable transport system in the Hyperloop, again, if you want to be on the technical side or the, on the planning side, based on the okay. question, I think it's on the planning side. And the planning side is you have to be aware of the current requirement in the country. And there are different requirements for one MRA to another. And therefore, okay. you have to keep up with the standards and uh, uh, planning standards within each uh, uh, Emirates and each country. Um, any, another question is any PGCEs for those looking to get out of the rat race so as to pass on actual business experience to the next generation? <laughs> Paul, I can see you smiling. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there are always opportunities for us to um, employ adjunct faculty. So we, we do employ a lot of adjunct faculty to, to deliver lectures as well as tutorials um, and to bring in that experience. In terms of PGCE, we have something which is similar to that, um, which is a postgraduate uh, qualification in, in academic uh, leadership. So you, you could do that rather than the PGCE, which is more for secondary schools. Um, so definitely this is worth a conversation offline if you've got business experience you want to bring to uh, to to our students we'd be very happy to have a chat with you and, and we could look to maybe develop uh, your skills and perhaps pick up a, a postgraduate certificate in higher education um yeah okay. um and i think we'll take one question and then wrap it up given the current pandemic one popular option is to enroll in online courses on platforms does Harriet Watt provide online programs for working professionals like us? Amar or Paul? Yes, so, so we do offer uh, many, many, uh, even before COVID, many uh, of our programs uh, on, online. And uh, what we call it independent distance learning, which means that you don't actually need to, to come on campus and you can finish the entire uh, degree uh, from home. And we could also arrange for the students to be assessed in their own country. So even if they were not in the UAE, they can still take on exams. Uh, and uh, we have a large network uh, of part partners where we can actually hold the exams uh, in, in across the globe. So we've, we've got a lot of uh, uh, programs that we deliver on online, absolutely. Oh, okay. Just to add to that, so we, yeah. yeah, just to add to that, we've uh, our MBA um, is delivered through a combination of either complete distance learning or through blended learning. Uh, so you okay. can you can take either at the course in blocks, or you can do it uh, entirely online. Um, and, and a similar thing is offered through some of the other schools as well. I think Aegis and uh, Mar was also offering uh, online. Yeah. Um, and I think with that, we'll come to an end. If you have any further questions for any of our esteemed panelists, please make sure, okay, there's one more question, but maybe we can take that offline. Do you see media and marketing courses going up? I think that's a, <laughs> a sector that needs more upskilling. <laughs> I guess um, I'm popularity for sure. Um, price, I'm not quite so sure. Um, I mean, no, I mean, there, there's definitely... Um, an increase in demand uh, for media and marketing. And, and I see actually the government just this last week has, has, has opened a media academy here in the UAE, um, which is um, an interesting development and very positive de development, I think, in terms of developing specialist skills. Sure. Um, so any other questions you have, feel free to send it and we'll get them answered. Uh, thank you all so much for your time today. A big thank you to our panelists, to our attendees. We hope you found the session really beneficial. It was so insightful and lots of uh, experience, combined experience that spoke to us today. Uh, you can access the entire video on our website, glassbusiness.com. Do let us know any feedback that you have, any comments as well. And um, yeah, please make sure that you follow us on all our social channels. Thank you once again. Thank you and have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Thank you, Art. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Thank you.